Okay. Hello. Thank you for having me. So my talk today is about losing context and whether the tra whether that transition or change that happens from an archaeological site to museums or whatever change which has happened has altered our phenomenological experience and then through our ability to create agency. So, what is a phenomenological experience? That's not right. There you go. So, context is everywhere. Objects are always found in some kind of context. It may be a historical landscape, and that historical landscape is intrinsic to mine. So this one here is just a picture showing an uh, idea of how Stonehenge landscape would have worked a couple of years ago. We also have a lot of stone, um, objects on display in museums. That's a context in itself, a different context, but nonetheless still a context. And of course, we have landscapes like this one at Whitby Court, where you've sought with gardens or fountains all in situ against the building. So this is all about context and we all experience it as one. Phenological experience is a, an approach that concentrates on the study of consciousness and the object of direct experience. Phenology is the study of structures of consciousness, this is from the first person. So it's all about our personal experiences of archaeology, of heritage. And this was developed extensively in, in post-processual archaeology as a way to try and understand the past. Ultimately, there have been criticisms of it in archaeology as uh, projecting your personal viewpoint of this heritage onto the past. But however, from the perspective of people today, it, is, it, is, it works. It's a way to experience and understand how people look at it today and we're answering questions about today. So that criticism about it projecting views is different because if we're assessing how people look at it today, we're using those people who are looking at it. So this is a prime example used by Christopher Tilly when um, uh, discussing um, phenomenal experience. This is Vingen, uh, this is Vingen in, in Norway. It's a rock carving site uh, with over 2,000 individual carvings on stones as you can see in, in this image here. There's a number of different images, there's sometimes deer depicted, other animals, and this is part of the experience. The landscape is part of it. You have to climb rocks to see certain carvings, and that influences your experience of that entire site. This is a place of movement and change, and a place which was experienced by people back then and today. People still will drive there and visit the site. And we see phenomenal experiences today. We've seen that people still visit historic sites, they still experience that entire landscape. So this is La Morna in Cornwall. This is a small stone monument, about maybe just under a metre high. It was erected in the 19th century. It's a memorial to a student who found his death off those cliffs. As you can see in the image, this is two different, completely different days. I went there one time in summer, one time around Christmas. And you can see how the experience is completely different depending on when you visit. That experience, you've got the sun, you've got wind coming in, and you can see the landscape around you. On this one, over hand, it is cloudy, and you can't see very far. In some parts during that day, you couldn't even see the sea at the bottom, which gives you a completely different sense of the landscape and experience around you. But throughout all this, this stone monument is there, and you can understand the relationship. That monument is key to that landscape because it memorializes an incident which happened there, and it's been part of its context. And so, We've got this phenomenal experience, but what is the relationship we create around it? So, another theory used in archaeology is agency, which is the idea that an agent is being with, is being with capacity to act, and the agency then to exercise the manifestation of this capacity. The experience of interaction in creating a life story and the imposition of form of material by a socially situated creative activity. And again, we see this enacted today. So, war memorials and memorial in general, they are modern phenomena. We see them everywhere there. There's Cotes Park, for example. You see the cenotaph there and Diana Memorial there. Both are parts of our identity and ways we interact with society today. They provide us an opportunity to demonstrate our respect, our memories. They are the physical embodiment of remembrance. And we have certain ways we behave around them. Those are based on our societal 
on, on society. You see, Poppy Reeves laid around the cenotaph to remember those who gave their lives. And we create taboos around these sites. For example, in the cenotaph, you may have, a couple of years ago, saw the outcry when Top Gear drove a car around there quite fast. And the criticism they got for doing it, and then having to make a public apology for that. And then at Diana's Memorial, people encouraged to interact with it through the water, use it almost like a park. You see all the children interacting. It's part of a way to change how that memorial is used, rather as a place of happiness, rather than a place here where you're more respectful. And so, how does this apply to sites and context change? So, as I saw about this monument here, but the one in Lamorna, what would happen if we moved that into museum? We've isolated it away from this landscape. We've isolated it away from the smells, the taste, that salt in the air, and you put it in a museum. Many civil monuments are on display in museums, and they've been removed from their original context. How do we understand that impact? That impact of, it could be seen as decay, the decay of the intangible. How do we deal with it? Is it a problem? Many people don't know. <coughs> Many stone monuments you see. This is Margam Museum, yeah, near well, Margam. This is a stone monument museum dedicated to a display of stone monuments from the South Wales area, particularly around the Bridge End area. They are stone monuments which cover the early medieval period to the, to the later medieval period. And they come from a variety of sources. Some are from in situ sites on top of hills. Others were found as, as fence posts, bridges, and have been removed here. But before we got to here, they were displayed at Margam House, so essentially a private collection with limited access. And then Caddy, a public, public funded organisation, brought them in to display them in a former schoolhouse just outside the church in Margam. These stones represent a major problem which can be seen across this entire industry. Many of their original contexts have been lost. They've been disconnected. Currently, we are seeing an unrivaled pro um, issue with churches. In the last 10 years, 110 churches in Wales alone have closed. That's 8% of all, of all Anglican churches in Wales. That is a major problem for us. How do we deal with all those stone monuments on display in, in, the museum, in uh, original situations? They've lost the community which cared for them. They've lost the people who would cut the grass, maintain the monuments, interact with them. That interaction was part of those monuments entity. They are memorials to loved ones, and memorials to how we practice religion, how we interact with society. And once they close, that starts to change. Many cases you see them brought into museums, not to go on display, but just to go into storage. Or in other cases, a standard practice is to bury them, preserve them, preventing them being access to the environment around us. But ultimately, any method which does that, or any method which we remove it, or disconnect it in some form, because we're losing that link to original landscape, and we're losing that intangible connection to the site. How do we deal with that? You have to um, think about those intangible things that make these objects, things of human creation, which makes them an artifact rather than just an object. The Sueno Stone, uh, one of the best preserved Pictish stone monuments in Scotland, one of the largest as well, and it's always had a need to preservation. You see it here earlier on in the 90s, you can see the peaked cap covering it, protecting it, and a barrier around it. That in itself um, does break its relationship with the landscape, but evidence they've gone further to preserve a physical object you can see here, it displays it in a glass case. This is designed to create a, a stable environment in the landscape that was erected. However, what happens to the people who want to see it? It may well preserve the monument for much longer than it would otherwise, but how do people interact with it? Do people get fed up because they can't get a nice photo of it anymore because of the glare on the glass? <coughs> Can they interact with it as it was previously? Is there a way we can perhaps negate that? Would have been another option would have been to move into a museum. What is best? They simply don't know whether what's happening, whether the intangible is decaying. 
And then here, yeah, Whitley Court, it's a, it's a burnt out stately home run and cared for by English heritage. It is completely different to how it once appeared, full of life, full of people, full of objects. Do we see it as a ruin today? Uh, how do we engage with the site compared to how people engaged with it in the past? It's, an, it's, an, it's an occupied. People really we experience it through going through the site as customers, visitors. You don't always see interaction with it. So how do we understand that building? Do you understand it as something which was lived in or something which is now just a shell? And then museum displays. Archaeological collections are on display in, in most museums. And often they're displayed, well, this is an example. You can see them isolated. But how does the fact you can't handle them anymore? These objects are designed and made by people. They are a product of human creation. How does the fact that we see them through a barrier affect our understanding of these objects as we walk through? Do we have a different relationship because the object is now isolated, void of complete context. So the question is, does, does this all, all these things change context? The change of phenomenal experience is happening. We see it as a result of a change of context. And it, does, does it result in a decay of that intangible aspect of that object? The breakdown in the relationship form between the person and the object. The object's agency, the relationship we form with it is changing. How, how can you have the same relationship with this object if you can't touch it, feel what it feel it. So we have to, do we have to look at ways to try and preserve the context as well as the physical object which we have to preserve just as much. So if we return to Wingen, this is a close-up image of some of his rock carvings. <laughs> this is how perhaps you would see it if it was on display in a museum, close up. And we can carry out research to understand the sites. And the image is, you can see the different features we talked about earlier such as the deer down the bottom. And by preserving contextual information of the site, we can apply it to an object in whatever location it is. We can therefore assume that even when a context is lost, stone monuments can retain a degree of, of the site through, through the research into it and the application of that context onto wherever we display. So we have the ability to preserve intangible information, which makes context viable and influences how we experience cultural heritage. To preserve the context is an act of preventive conservation. Pre preventing the decay. That is a disconnection from original connection. So how can we actually do this? There's many ways we can perhaps do it which have been seen in isolation but never talked about. So this is a hilt on the cobblestone uh, which is, has a very mixed history. It was on this, it's originally from Hilton and Cavill. It was moved to Song's Garden in the 19th century. Moved down to a British museum to be well, protested because of its removal to then be removed back to Scotland and back to the National Museum of Scotland, where it is currently on display, as you can see. It is experienced time, it's experienced wear. This is a picture of it today. It has been, the entire, one entire side has been lost through Puritan activism in the, in the 17th century, so we've lost a portion of this monument. But it doesn't mean the end of it. So this one image on your right is a replica put on the site where Hilton Castle Stone was originally sited. Archaeological investigations around here excavated the site and revealed the site which had been completely removed, preserved on the site. So they were able to well, put it back like a jigsaw and recreate the, the other side of it, preserving it like that. And then they funded a sculptor to, invent, to create a new one, as you can see there. This used traditional methods and used me and preserve something which the monument there could never have. That individual skill to make it. It also preserves the site of it as it was when created. Completely different to that monument there. That monument is a product of about 1400 years of environmental wear and movement. This one here is only about 15 years. So we're seeing a completely different view of it. A view that we would have recognised when it was created. Whitley Court. Should we be using public conservation? <coughs> public conservation is starting to be used. You see it in a number of museums, but it hasn't taken a foot really yet. But it has huge potential beyond demonstrating conservation. It has the ability to preserve the intangible. 
These buildings were cared for, interacted with, maintained throughout their history. If we don't do public conservation, we are isolating the, the, the building from that physical interaction, which is just as much part of that building as the building itself. It's the intangible element to it. And so by doing conservation work, when the building is open, we're demonstrating that these buildings are not isolated in time. They're actually experiencing weather, they're experiencing time, and we can demonstrate that we still interact with these buildings just as people maintaining them did when they were in use. Objects in museums. As I was saying, those displays create an idea that these are frozen in time. They are isolated individual objects. If we care for them and demonstrate their interaction on the in museums, such as here in the National Museum of Wales, we're demonstrating these paintings, in this case, are not in isolation. They are actually part of this world. They need to be cared for, which makes us more accountable and demonstrates that these objects are something which was interacted with, not just looked at. They would have been covered in houses sometimes during times of the year. They would have been cleaned regularly. And by seeing that happen, we're preserving a physical element of interaction with the object, which we don't do often. And in many cases, like handy collections, we need to explore how we use these objects to continue preserving that intangible element. And so I'll leave, finish on this last one. This is in Prittawal. You may well have seen that news story where a family uh, were caught on CCTV putting their child into it for a quick photo. A lot of people talked about how they needed to put new barriers, higher barriers, to prevent people getting into it. I would question whether that would help, whether the real issue is whether we've dehumanized it, whether we've made it an object void of human life, and part of that desire to humanize it resulted in some getting in it and damaging it. Perhaps if we are thinking about how these are human elements, we could work out a way to display it a more humane environment, perhaps through objection, uh, something shows you that this is this had a person in it. With this, you just see a stone trough. Perhaps the barriers aren't the answer here. Perhaps it is a need to actually place it back into the human world. Many of my examples have been examples of in situ on display in museums, but there are still going to be those many stone monuments and other objects in storage. How do we continue their connection to humanity? If people can't see them, many of them are inaccessible and they lose that human element, they lose that interaction, and they lose the reason we, we have them. We have them to share with the public. That is their heritage. If we do not do that, we have to question why we actually display it. I have, I have asked a lot of questions, to, theoretical questions to you today, but many of them have not been answered. And we don't know the answer to them. We need to concentrate a lot more on how we preserve the intangible object as much as we preserve the physical. How well do we know? We here may well know what we think about whether we are doing enough, but do we know what the public think? The people who see the heritage, the people we are caring it for, are we, as we tr striving to preserve a physical object, causing the decay of intangible, the decay of the metaphysical object itself? What makes this is what makes an object an artifact: the fact that it has this information around it, which is connected to humanity. At this time of change, with changes to conservation, as we try and preserve these, for example, the churches which are going out of use, how do you preserve both the tangible and the intangible, and preserve the monument as a whole? not just the individual bit. We need to be able to understand the impact of our work and our impacts on the intangible. Thank you. <laughs>